This is the second in a series of videos on sizing sawn wood beams. The definition of a sawn wood beam is a board which is sawn in a solid form out of a piece of a tree. It has a rectangular cross section. We're talking about sizing solid sawn wood beams. We're going to follow the procedure in the allowable stress design. And we're not going to use the load and resistance factor design, which is what's used in the textbook. So in studying the subject matter, do not go back to the textbook. Work off of these videos and the data given in these videos. The reason we're doing this is that the wood industry has never seriously embraced the load and resistance factor design. And part of the reason is that the yield stress of the material is so extremely variable that the wood people don't want to talk about yield stress. They would much prefer to just give you a design value, which is a safe value to which you can design. They take up the extreme variability in the wood uh, by keeping this design value down fairly low, which is why most wood structures typically tend to be a lot stronger than the design stresses to which they were designed. At any rate, we're going to go with the allowed stress design because even at this point in 2016, the wood industry is tending to focus on that design method. Our data is going to come from the National Design Specification for Stress Graded Lumber. And we'll talk about that more when we get down to this design procedure. For the moment, though, we're going to take a brief pause. And we're going to have a short lesson focused on one objective. We're going to take a pause and have some philosophical conversation on discerning patterns that allow us to think in a designerly way. Figuring out these patterns is at the absolute heart of what we do for a living as designers. And we're going to show, for example, why we have things like design guidelines for spans and proportions, and what is the technical underlying principles behind that. So we're going to take this pause, and then in the next lesson, we're going to return to the details of the procedure for sizing solid sawn lumber. So this entire lecture is going to be based on this particular visual image. We're going to, as I said, focus on discerning patterns that allow us to think in a designerly way. And initially, we're going to focus on simple span beams involving beams with rectangular cross section. So this would commonly apply to sawn lumber, glue lamb beams, laminated veneer lumber, which comes in cross rectangular cross sections. And it also applies at some level to all concrete beams or most concrete beams because most concrete beams have a rectangular cross section. It's rare that we find any kind of really exaggerated eye section in concrete because concrete like wood is not good enough in shear and it needs that extra material near the neutral axis to avoid failure. So in past lessons, we've talked about issues of shear capacity. In wood, we end up with high stress values near the ends of the beam. So this is the shear diagram, which is a maximum near the ends. Um, we tend to see this shear failure manifest at the end of the beam. And the reason is that that's not only where the shear is high, but also, the, the uh, material tends to be weaker there because of uh, moisture loss and cracking at the end of the beam. But we also see this failure as a horizontal shear failure because that's the weak direction of the grain. Parallel fibers tend to slide past each other, whereas cutting through the fibers is very difficult.
So we have this image of what a shear failure would look like. And we also have talked about moment capacity and what a moment failure would look like. The moment is zero at each end of the simple span beam. It's a maximum at the middle and it would manifest itself in either tearing of the fibers on the bottom or crushing of the fibers on the top. In the case of wood, it's going to tend to be the tearing of the fibers on the bottom because wood tends to be somewhat stronger in compression than in tension, partly because any knots, knots do not work well in tension, but they still work pretty well in compression. And then we talked about stiffness and the importance of having stiffness so that people perceive that their building is a quality building. Um, we look at the issue of deflection at the center of this simple span beam. And you'll notice I've shown here a depiction where shear capacity tends to be important when the depth of the beam is large. So if we have very high loads, we'll make the beam relatively deep and shear becomes a major concern under those circumstances. Moment capacity tends to be more of a concern for intermediate proportions. And then when beams become really shallow, they tend to be fairly flexible and tend to move a lot. So these are, these are patterns I'm talking about, but they're going to be reinforced by the mathematics that we're going to go through. So in previous lessons, we learned, for example, that there's something bad that happens, which is shear stress. Shear stress can fail the beam in this mode. So we need to be able to keep the shear stress below some reasonable value. And we also learned that the peak shear stress is going to be the shear force at the end of the beam divided by the cross section and then multiplied by 1.5. The average shear stress would just be V over A, but the shear stress varies over the cross section and it is worst at the center or at the neutral axis, which is along this line right here or this plane. And this 1.5 expresses how much larger the peak shear stress is than the average shear stress. Um, so let's go down continue in this column for a moment, we have a shear force V, which we learned previously for a simple span beam is W times L over two. W is the distributed stress, line distributed stress along the top of the beam. L is the length of the beam. So W would be in pounds per foot, for example, and L would be in feet. So W times L is the total downward load on the top of the beam. So it's the cumulative load of all these distributed forces here. And these two end reactions have to provide the force to resist that downward force. So if the total downward force is WL, each of these upward forces from the end reactions has to be WL over two, so that when we sum them together, the two upward forces equal the distributed downward force. So I've just replaced V or V max, it should be, with WL over two. And again, I'll emphasize that this is W dead plus W dot live because we are in the allowed stress design. So in other words, we're not using any kind of factors in this case. So I express this without any factors. Now, what I did here in parentheses is to substitute this expression for V. Now, if I can substitute for the cross-sectional area, since it's a rectangular cross-section, the area is going to be the base or the thickness of the beam times the height or depth of the cross-section. So it's BH. So I've replaced H with BH and V with WL over 2. Now I'm going to rearrange all of this and I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by one over BH to bring the BH up into the denominator here. And then I'm going to rearrange things where I put two B in the denominator, but I take an L outside and an H outside and I'm going to combine them together as a ratio. 
of L over H. And then just for emphasis, I put to the first power there. And normally we would never do that, except I'm about to proceed to look at all these other things like moment capacity and stiffness. And we're going to try to understand how they vary as this ratio of L over H. And by the way, my motive for doing that is I already intuitively understand from experience that the proportions of the beam, the length to the depth, is a pretty important factor. So I'm going to couple those two things together to see if I can see a pattern. Okay, so we also said we, we know that there's a bending stress, which is what's causing that kind of failure there. And that bending stress we ascertained was equal to something called the moment divided by something called the section modulus. And for this simple span beam, we already proved that the moment is WL squared over 8. And again, I write W as the W dead plus W live. Um, and again, there are no load factors because we're not working in load factor design. So we have WL squared over 8 for M. And we also proved that the section modulus was the base times the height squared for the cross section divided by 6. Now I want to clean up this messy expression. And the way I do it is I get rid of this denominator. And the way I do that is I multiply that times 6 over BH squared, which annihilates the denominator. But I can't do that unless I multiply everything by 1. So I have 6 over BH squared divided by 6 over BH squared. So these things are all annihilated. And this 6 goes into the numerator and the BH squared goes into the denominator. 6 over 8 is 3 over 4. And again, I'm going to cluster things together. So actually, this formula is not quite correct because I left out my 1 over B. So if you'll forgive this brief pause, and I put that in. So now, move this over slightly. Um, I have, and by the way, this should all be an equal sign. I'm sorry, I have a lot of stuff to clean up here, don't I? So, I took a B out and just put it in a factor here. And I probably should have done that right here, too. So, you can follow the thought process. It's not the most efficient way, but it will help you understand how this process is occurring. Okay. Boy. Okay. So I pulled out the cross-sectional properties 1 over B by itself and L over H by itself. And then I'm going to come here. And I'm going to do the same sort of thing. So I have the 1 over B here and L over H there. And it's to the second power because I have L squared and I have H squared. And now I'm going to come here and I'm going to say the deflection is, according to what we have demonstrated before, going to be 5WL to the 4th over 384EI, or IE, where I is the cross-sectional stiffness and E is the stiffness of the material. Now, I want to reiterate that in the case of steel, we would just use W live here because we're only interested in the movement under live load. That's what's going to affect people's perception. However, because wood is a material that creeps, we'd like somehow for our design procedure to account for that in some way. 
So we don't want to have too shallow a member that's likely to creep and change shape under long-term loads. So we've put in half of WDED, and that's just prescribed by the wood industry, and there's no uh, detailed logic to it that just jumps off the page at us, except that it seems to make sense that for a material that creeps, we would like for the deflection under dead load to be somehow accounted for in this whole process. It's not mathematically pure, but it gets at the heart of an issue that we need to account for in some way. So now I'm going to take this deflection as 5WL squared over 384EI, and I'm going to rearrange by taking one of these L factors down under the denominator here. So instead of L to the fourth, it's L cubed. And the reason I did that is that this proportion of delta over L is what we're usually concerned about. If the beam is twice as long, we let it deflect twice as much. So it's that ratio that's crucial. And now I want to insert the moment of inertia, which for a rectangular section is BH cubed over 12, which we also talked about previously. And now to clean up this 12 down here, I'm going to multiply the denominator by 12, but then I have to multiply the numerator by 12 in order to keep the mathematics legitimate. So this 12 is going to cancel that. That 12 is going to get multiplied times this 5, which is going to give us 60. And then 64 divided by 384 is 0 0.156. So this is just a constant that we want to summarize to make the calculations as simple as possible. So we have all this stuff, which has to do with the material and the loads and so forth. And again, we're going to factor out all the, the cross-sectional stuff. So we have a 1 over B factor. We have an L cubed and H cubed. So we put them together and we end up again with 1 over B. But then we have L over H cubed. Now, what this says is all these things are sensitive to length in a very sensitive way, particularly this term, L cubed over H, which is also very sensitive to depth. But also, there is an amazing pattern that leaps off the page. Every one of these things can be reduced down to some sort of an expression which contains the, the proportions the term L over H. In the case of shear, it's to the first power. So we would argue, well, the proportions aren't very important in the case of shear. But then it's L over H squared in the case of moment, or bending stress, or flexure, as we sometimes call it. L over H squared is very sensitive. L over H cubed is extremely sensitive. This sensitivity is why we really have to worry about beams. When they become very shallow, they become very springy and they move too much and people will perceive them as having inferior quality. Now, this incredibly consistent pattern that every one of these issues is expressed in terms of a ratio of L over H is what allows us to come up with really straightforward, simple design guidelines that say the proportions of a wood beam, a solid foam beam, or a, um, a glue lamb beam, or a rectangular concrete beam, those proportions need to be within some reasonable range to assure that this and this do not become a problem. If we let L over H become too large, in other words, the, the proportions are too shallow, we're going to have too much bending stress. If we let L over H become too large, in other words, the depth is not adequate, then we're going to have serious deflection issues. These equations embody all the physical processes that allow us to talk about spans and proportions of beams. And spans and proportions of beams are the most fundamental kind of understanding that an architectural designer can have. And right within these equations is all the mathematics that expresses 
how it's possible for you to think in those terms. So that ends our philosophical pause of looking for patterns that allow us to think in a designerly way, particularly in the context of this whole issue of what is the technical and mathematical underpinning of the whole sizing of solid song beams. And we're going to return in the next video to that sizing procedure.